Hey everyone, welcome to the Open Source Founder Podcast. Joining me today is Michele Riva, co-founder and CTO of Forama, an open source full text and vector search engine. Michele, thank you so much for joining us. I'm super excited to start with some information about your background and uh, how Orama got started. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, big fan Thanks. of your project, so it's a real <laughs> pleasure to be here talking with you now. <laughs> Appreciate it. I've been working for around a decade right now as a, as a software engineer professionally. And in the last past few years, um, I've been involved into open source and um, public speaking and knowledge sharing. So um, I've been very active in the community for, for creating open source projects, contributing to others. But most importantly, um, I was working at Nearform, uh, which is a very important company for me. And just for the audience to know, Nearform is the um, it's one of the few companies that have full-time people working on Node.js. So it's, it's truly committed to open source. And I was part of the developer experience team, which is the team that works on Node.js specifically. I wasn't working on Node.js myself, but the rest of the team was. I was more uh, concentrated on um, TC39 for certain things. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I was basically creating some polyfills for newer versions of JavaScript. Um, and I was more interested in building new solutions rather than working on existing ones. I, I know that's very typical for engineers, <laughs> but that's how it is. And I've been lucky enough to work in this company for almost a couple of years. And uh, for, a, for a big conference, which is called We Are Developers in Berlin in uh, 2022, if I remember correctly, I wanted to create um, something cool. So I created a full text search engine in JavaScript. And it was, you know, very sketchy. Uh, it didn't work very well, but it was very fast. Um, the reason why it was fast is, first of all, JavaScript is fast. Like um, a lot of people say, no, it's not performant, but that's false. It's pretty performant if you know how to write it. And I was lucky enough to be in a team where people deeply cared about performances. So they, they could, you know, mentor me and teach me a lot of stuff on, on JavaScript performances, Node.js performances. So it became very fast. It was in the microseconds area for most searches on millions of records in JavaScript again. Um, and after I gave the talk um, in Berlin about this full text search engine, which was more a talk on algorithms and data structures in JavaScript, uh, someone put it on Hacker News. It went viral. And eventually, the boss of the company, the former, uh, sorry, the, um, the founder of Nearform came to me and said, OK, look, we are a consultancy firm. We can bring this you know, as a, as a product, so I'm going to help you, and I will connect you with the people to, to create a company out of this. So thanks to Kian, uh, the, the founder of Nearform, I have been able to spin off my own company. Um, and yeah, that, that's how everything started, basically. It was just a little toy and eventually became um, a proper company. And, and it's still in the process of becoming a proper company of, after almost one year now. <laughs> I love it. Well, thanks so much. Thanks so much for the background. And, uh, you know, I, I, in one of your conference talks, I saw that you said there's no slow programming languages, just bad algorithms and data structure design, right? Yes, um, that's the point. And so I, I, I particularly liked that quote. And I saw you mentioned how basically, you know, you're a fan of Elasticsearch, but of course, yeah. you know, it's, it's hard to deploy. Uh, the memory consumption is hard. And then who wants to work with Java? <laughs> that's, a, that's another uh, a key a key point there, and then you know there's there's Algolia, but of course like at scale for an enterprise it's way too expensive, and it's kind of like a black box. You cannot really tinker with it and extend it. So now moving to Orama, which is solving these problems and of course achieves like performance that is like incredible. I uh, would love to hear what the journey looked like in 2023. Yeah. So first of all, just for you to know, that's a fun one. Uh, I'm a huge Elasticsearch fan. I want this to be very clear. I sent my resume like twice to Elasticsearch. They never replied. So I took this very personally. <laughs> and I created a company on an <laughs> engine. But I, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, but uh, it was it was fun to mention. I've learned a lot, of course, by by working with Algolia firsthand. So, uh, sorry, Algolia and Elasticsearch firsthand. Uh, so, of course, I do still appreciate those uh, search engines, even though they are competitors now. Uh, but I still love them because they're great. So with that being said, we, we started the company in 2023 
and we hired the, the very first engineers to work on something very different. So Elasticsearch and Maily Search and you know also Mini Search, which is a very nice project in the JavaScript ecosystem. Uh, it's a JavaScript full text search engine, or you think of Fuse, Lunar, etc. Um, they have something in common. Uh, they only run on the browser, only run on, on the server, uh, but they can't run at the edge. So that was something cool we, we wanted to make happen with Rama. So the first thing we did was to take the open source Rama, which is the one you can get on github.com slash Rama search slash Rama and put it at the edge. So we are now basically the, the entire year we spent it in building a system, a distributed system that basically deploys your index, even larger ones, uh, to 300 global locations. Um, and the advantages of running something at the edge is that you get virtually infinite scaling, uh, meaning if I am during Black Friday, for example, and I have an e-commerce and I get a spike of requests, I don't have a server to manage. So it's truly serverless in a sense. Um, so you get like billions of requests per second, no problem. Like CDNs were meant also to propagate DDoS attacks. So we are cool with that. Um, it's also very performant. Uh, we have big limitations in terms of CPU time, for example. So um, we can perform most searches in the microseconds area, and we can aggregate that the results and then to the user and the run trip time, so since you get your first request from the browser and you get the data back from the server, has basically very limited latency because there is a node that it's always close to you. Like we deploy in 100 countries, like 300 cities worldwide. So, you know, wherever you are in the world, even mainland China, for example, which is not super accessible with AWS, et cetera, like not every provider has a server there. We got it. And even if you connect from there, you have a server that it's very close to you. So it like the time that, it, that the request takes to get back to you, it's very limited. So it's very fast. It's very scalable, but also very cheap because the, the price, it's basically the same as fetching an image at the edge, you know, on a CDN, which again, it's meant for serving billions of females. It's, it's a very nice model, um, pretty difficult to program with, I gotta be honest. Uh, but yeah, this is what makes edge applications a bit more appealing to me than, you know, standard servers, for example, server side applications, at least, or browser side applications only like the ones I mentioned that are fantastic products, but they could potentially run there, but to make them run on the CDN, uh, um, I experienced this firsthand. It's going to be very difficult. Totally. And we'll see, you know, later on, uh, people sticking around the demo actually that performance in, in, in microseconds and I'm excited to, to get there later on. Uh, how's the open source motion been uh, for you and your team uh, in terms of the community as well as managing the project? And I know you're familiar from the past, but uh, I'd love to hear uh, what uh, the experience with Arama has been like so far and whether there's any advice for other maintainers or open source founders. Yeah, yeah so first of all, um, you know, I've been very happy with the fact that we made entire releases without the core team working on those releases. Like community first releases, people like wanting, I don't know, Vietnamese language support. I, I don't speak Vietnamese and it's really difficult for me to, you know, build and test proper stemmers, removing proper stop words, et cetera. But we got people getting there and saying, yeah, no problem, I can do that. So they just do that for us. Sometimes we give them a bounty, why not? <laughs> but you know, um, <laughs> Other times they just show up and they, they want to implement something that is missing and they do that. And, and again, I'm very happy to be able to make entire releases without having the Orama team working on those releases because that's, that's just fantastic. Um, that's pretty unexpected. I wasn't expecting that like two years ago when I first started the project. So that's cool. And again, it's not a super accessible project, gotta be honest. It's very technical and you know it, it's algorithms and data structures again. Plus a lot of optimizations because if you wanna run on every single JavaScript runtime nowadays, you got to support BAN, you got to support Cloudflare workers, Dino, Node, browsers. So you really need to know JavaScript. Uh and there's no abstraction there that can help you with that yet. We we should probably invent it. Uh <laughs> but uh, you know. It really teaches you to think in JavaScript, which is very nice, in my opinion. 
Absolutely. And I think in the process of uh, using Orama, there's also like a, a test suite that actually people can can test out their algorithms and the data structures and, you know, learn in the process of building with Orama uh, and become better engineers and better at optimizing their systems. So I really like that. And, and again, maybe we'll get to that later on. You come from a functional programming background, uh, you know, working with Haskell, for example. So how have you experienced these change? So <laughs> that's very funny. <laughs> uh, yes. Um... I've been working a bit with Haskell and and a bit of, of Elixir. Um, so I gotta say, working at the CDN, for example, is a functional model in my opinion. So Orama is an immutable database. We treat it as an immutable data structure. So every time you want to update Orama at the edge, for example, you have to redeploy the index. So in a sense, I was mainly inspired by functional programming in in working that way. There is an inversion of paradigm when it comes to to search in general. It, it's not just full text, but also um, vector hybrid search and newer kind of searches that ChatGPT told us that we need to implement. Um, and making everything running at the edge and making it you know, in a functional architecture actually made it possible. So that's something that I kept from my functional background. but there is a good quote I can give you from the, um, it was the V8 documentation, I think, that said, like, if, if you want your JavaScript to be as fast as C, just write it as you write C. So it's not functional, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, functional programming in JavaScript, it's very fun. JavaScript itself started as a functional language back then in 1995. But nowadays, um, if you want to have cool performances, you have to make two compromises. First of all, write um, imperative code. Second, if you really care about performance, it's going to be pretty ugly. But again, that's a compromise. And sometimes you, you can't compromise with speed. For example, if you, if you want to execute your code on Cloudflare workers, you only got 50 milliseconds for executing the code. So it, you see, you can't compromise with performances there. And sometimes functional programming makes it a bit harder on JavaScript specifically to run that fast. Then you have other programming languages such as OCaml, Haskell, etc., that are faster, but for different reasons. Um, but that's not the case for JavaScript, sadly. And yet, Ram, of course, has the the crazy performance, and again, we'll, we'll get to that. I'm curious how you have experienced the the go to market motion for Orama, which can be done, you know, via outbound. It can be done through marketing and the inbound interest. And of course, you mentioned that a lot of people, you know, prior to funding the company, had their eyes on you through uh, the Hacker News post that someone did on your behalf, which is amazing when that happens. And so, how did you experience uh, last year on that front? Was it mainly just building, 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 and letting the work speak for itself, or did you also have, you know, a quote unquote enterprise? Kind of like outbound sales motion to get the feedback from big organizations who have such uh, big scale needs with their search. Yeah, so we definitely have some design partners that are helping us at scale. So if you think of large enterprises, for example, we have some large enterprises that are helping us uh, in shaping, uh, you know, a search engine or as we call it nowadays, an answer engine uh, as they wish it to be. Um, and those companies are mainly looking for switching off, you know, a different engine into Orama. So um, this is really helping us because we can see the problems that we need to solve. And we also acknowledge the scale uh, at where we need to bring our product to. So that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, we spent the past year basically building and it was pretty hard because again, um, there's, there are no many applications running at the edge and there's not a lot, a lot of, um, literature on how to run applications that are so complex at the edge. Because again, like if you think of again Cloudflare workers, for example, your your worker size must be like one megabyte, but an index could be one gigabyte. How how do you solve that? So we had to solve that problem, you know, and and it took forever, <laughs> literally. Like that that's hard programming. Uh, that, that's some hardcore programming going on and it wasn't easy and we, we had some help from many people in, in getting there and we have a team now that finally um, has been able to prove that this model is working but it took time 
so we are now ready to onboard some first customers and and get back to those enterprises that are helping us and and start finally to to onboard their clients um so i can say a lot more about our strategy at this point we will probably announce something in in a few weeks or months um but I won't be the person announcing this. I think our CEO and our marketing persons are the, the ones that are best fit <laughs> for this. I'm just a technical guy. I'll stick to the technical parts. <laughs> <laughs> a, a technical guy who goes around the world, of course, like presenting and educating people. And, and that's super unique. And I really admire that, actually. And, you know, congratulations and keep it up. <laughs> I, I, I was also curious uh, to ask what might be coming up next. If there's a milestone you could share on the product front. Um, yeah. If you see, for example, the kind of a, um, edits that we made to the engine, like uh, until version 1.2.4, we were just a full text search engine. We we had all the goods like faceting, like gro uh, grouping, uh, sorting. We we had it all. Like whatever you could do on other search engines, you could do it with Rama. Then we implemented vector search, so you could provide like a vector and retrieve uh, results based on their semantic meaning. And now with Rama 2.0, we have geo search. We have um, hybrid search. So we basically perform both high, uh, vector and full text search, aggregate the results and understand if you're searching for something rather than something else. And I can give an example of why this is important. So if I, um, that's a very silly example. And I'm so sorry because I couldn't find another greater example than that. So if I search for a movie to watch with my six years old daughter, right? I'm clearly looking for something um, and, and I don't know how to express what I'm looking for other than this must be a family movie, you know. But if I search, for example, for a movie about a doctor that is possessed, like I'm looking for the exorcist, you know, the movie. And that's totally different. Like these results are totally different. I can give you results for the exorcist if you're looking for a family movie. So this is where Rama makes the distinction. If you're searching by meaning or you're searching by keyword, we get this and we give you the right result every time. So Orama 2.0 has done that. There will be Orama 2.1 and 2.2 and etc. and then Orama 3.0. Um, I can't spoiler where we're going, but we have a very nice plan to get there. We will certainly uh, enhance our AI capabilities. Right now, for example, with Orama 2.0, uh, we also generate our own embedding models that are faster, cheaper, and closer to you than OpenAI. So you can generate embeddings automatically with Orama, but we will see that in just a second. Um, and so we are you know, moving a bit more in the RAG space where you have these um, way of searching that, again, it's more about the meaning, not just the keywords. And we want to provide you the best experience either on the browser or the server or the cloud or the edge you choose. We provide that to you. Love it. And I'm, and I'm super bullish, uh, I have to say. Uh, is, there, uh, is there any mistake that you know, might have happened, something you would, could urge other founders to avoid? Uh, I know it hasn't been too long of a time and it's going, it's going really well from, from the outside. I was wondering if there's anything we could share with people. Uh, here, mm, I think it's not a proper mistake, but sometimes I believe you should really define your design partners, and because eventually these are the users you're gonna get, and you should definitely always listen to your users. So whenever you have a doubt, for example, are my users gonna gonna like this? Do they want this in the first place? It's like the, the only real people you should ask is the users at this point. So one mistake I can see is probably I would have loved to learn that a bit earlier, <laughs> you know, even when that was, a, you know, an open source project and nothing more. That would have simplified things so much. Now we are in a situation where eventually we, um, we, we respect that rule, let's say. Um, it's a startup rule, if you will. Uh, but I wish I learned that earlier. Like, user is the king, and eventually you're going to serve users. 
So just build stuff for users, not for yourself, uh, for yourself, or you know. For, mm -hmm. Your Thanks for sharing product. this. And, and, and to follow up, is there, any, is there any specific process or heuristic you use for prioritizing? Because, you know, your design partners and your users, they might try to pull you in a different direction. They might have all these different requests. And, you know, there's only so much bandwidth. There's only so much time every day. So how do you go about prioritizing? And I know this is super challenging for everyone. Just curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so thankfully enough, um, the founding team, so it, it, it's me um, and a CEO and a head of design. So we are three people with three different departments, you know, and we have three different perspectives. So there is the business per perspective, there is the product perspective, and there is the technical perspective. That's, that's awesome. Uh, you know, in Y Combinator, there is the hacker, the hustler, and the designer uh, founding team. Like, that's the perfect. Uh, three kind of performing <laughs> team and that's us like I, I really love this and um and i see why this is this is such important because those three perspectives really helps you understand what you need to prioritize for example um and most importantly to understand the point of view of different users like i can definitely understand the point of view of a user that is a developer but i can't really understand fully uh, you know, a marketing person or a business person or anyone else that is not deeply technical and needs a solution that it's not super technical. Uh, so having, again, multiple point of views, it's really helping. And then I got to say, we, we have a part-time project manager that is really, really, really helping. Um, so having a third person, you know, third party that comes and say, okay, we really need to prioritize and we prioritize with some strategy, with some structure. At, at a certain point of a lifespan of a startup, it's becoming, you know, pretty handy. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing this. Do you have uh, any, any conferences that you're planning to attend uh, the next months throughout this year? Um, anything so, planned? Not yet. I got a couple, but they're not announced yet. So I can't really tell, <laughs> uh, but also I'm moving a lot. So um, it's going to be a bit more difficult this year because I really want to concentrate on <laughs> working, working, working for, for this year. Maybe in 2025, I'm going to move a bit more, um, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. Uh, are there any other notes that you think would be helpful for people to hear before we proceed to the demo? I'm super excited about it. Uh, I think you should all put a star on GitHub. <laughs> that would really, really <laughs> help if you could. And, and I'm going to show you why in just a second with the demo. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and actually, I guess I, I just thought I think it would be useful to ask you this before we go to the demo. If you were starting today as a developer, right? Maybe you're in college, maybe you're going out of college and you want to start your career. Um, is there any rule of thumb you would follow or is there, is there something that you could recommend to people who are just getting started and would like to work in tech and be a professional software engineer? Oh, that's hard. I know this tough question and kind of generic. No, but it's a, it's, it's a cool question. And, and I think every developer has a different answer. So I'm just giving you mine. There are multiple levels of, you know, a career that you can achieve in software engineering. I truly believe that if you if you want to see a very long trajectory going on, uh, so seeing yourself progressing in your career, you really have to invest a lot of time early in your career. Um, so the first two, three, four, five years, you really have to work at night. And I'm sorry in saying that. I do understand that everyone has a life. I do understand that work is not everything. But this is a very hard job, and there's no college, there's no university that it's it's gonna teach you how to do that job for real. Um, I've been working with graduated engineers for a long time. They are super smart, super in incredibly talented people and educated people. But I can't tell the difference, you know, with self-taught developers that really spend their nights early on their careers, trying to learn something more about programming. So with that being said, I'm not saying that 
college and university is useless because it's not like if I could go back, I would do college and university, but that's not for learning how to program. That's for knowing the unknowns that I'm facing today, because my problem as a self-taught engineer, I couldn't go to college because I didn't have money basically and I needed to work. Um, my problem is that I'm facing a lot of unknowns, unknowns. Like I didn't know that I had to learn this. I didn't know that I had to, you know, go look into this other stuff. And I have this feeling that people that studied um, have a different approach. They have a method to follow whenever they face this kind of unknown. And they probably have a broader sense of the unknowns that they are going to face moving on a project, moving on a career, etc. And this is very valuable. Um, again, sometimes it's not a problem for me. Other times it is. Uh, but if I could go back in time, I would probably study a bit more uh, because sometimes it's pretty frustrating. But this is not preventing you from getting a very nice career in computer uh, science or you know, in programming in general. I love these insights. Um, would, you, would you say, uh, just a last follow-up question here, would you say that the skill set that engineers need to build nowadays has been expanded to also include, you know, building in public, doing uh, media, doing marketing? And is that becoming at all a, a necessity, quote-unquote, or like a very nice to have? Uh, that's the tip of the iceberg, you know. Um, you see developers mm -hmm. doing marketing, you see developers doing content and conferences and being influencers on Twitter. But again, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is like the 0.00001% of developers worldwide trying to um, express themselves. And they're doing this pretty well, if you ask me. But the vast majority of developers are not interested in having a career that goes you know, into content creation or I'm building in public, in creating startups or being, you know, CTOs and managers of other developers, which is fine. Like that, that's totally cool. Um, I think it's not necessary for everyone to get on Twitter and get a hundred thousand likes on, on every post. It's, it's pretty useless if you don't care about that. It's a pretty useless metric. Uh, but I do also understand that sometimes having a good network it's really helping you in your career. So what I would recommend is, um, I said previously, you should really study in your, you know, during the night, early your career, but during the day, just make some connections. <laughs> you know, so you only got 24 <laughs> hours. Make sure to also, you know, um, grow your networks and your connections, because this is what it's going to be life-changing for you rather than your technical skills. Like your technical skills are going to be just fine. You might not be the, the strongest in algorithms, but if you are a pretty good one in relationships, th this is helping you a lot more. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and working in open source, contributing to open source can definitely sure. help yeah. there, especially for younger people who don't have that professional setting experience working with teams. Well, with open source, you can contribute to you know, production software and work with other people and get mentored in the process. And just as a, as a middle way in terms of kind of like creating also content in, in, in some sense, I think a middle way would be to learn in public or to have your own blog where you have the till, today I learn. You kind of like document your journey, and do it for yourself as a journal. And maybe that's, you know, that can exercise that muscle a little bit uh, should you find yourself in a position later on where you'd like to express those talents even more. Uh, definitely not a requirement, as you said, uh, just another avenue for people uh, to, to, to explore the talents. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks, thanks for the insights uh, here. And uh, unless there's anything else you would like to add, uh, maybe you can jump to the demo, maybe start with showing the repository on GitHub and then yeah. uh, the demo yeah. for Amazon. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Let's start with the demo. I would probably share my screen. Let me see. Right. I will start with the repository. So in case anyone mm -hmm. wants to help by putting a star, um, this is the repo. Everything is open source. We got a bunch of great contributors and, oops, sorry. <laughs> and, um, and this is where you can find all the documentation and the highlighted features for Rama. So whatever you need, just click and get to the documentation. Everything should be documented. And if it's not, I'm responsible for that. So just ping me on Twitter on Slack, or Slack 
and I will do my best to try to fix this, all right? Um, but let's go back if you want to start with the demo. Um, I want to be honest, I totally forgot about the demo. Uh, so <laughs> but we're going to make something, no problem. All right, so let's start with the Rama Cloud. I'll be signing up with GitHub. All right, this is the dashboard. This is where you can create and deploy indexes. You can upload files. You can connect to e-commerce. And of course, we will be supporting multiple um, connections going on. Or you can create uh, you know, different data sources based on webhooks, REST APIs, or even Docusaurus or you know, other, other platforms that eventually we will support. There is a nice analytics page, uh, which is coming soon with a, a survey. I would really appreciate it anyone could compile that survey. And in developers tools, this is where you can put your OpenAI API key, and we will see why you might need this later. Um, I've already inserted mine uh, previously because I didn't want to share it publicly. I don't want to go bankrupt because of that. So once you insert it, you can never see it again. The only thing you can do, you see, this is text. Um, you can just replace it with another one, and that's it. So let's start. I'm going to show you the data set. So this is going to be the data set. Type. It's going to be a thousand uh, video games uh, with title, description, rating, which is a floating point number, and genres, um, which is an enumeration of genres. And we are going to index this and deploy this at the edge. So let me show you how it works. Let's create a new index. Let's call it Algora Demo. Description is optional. Let's select JSON file because we're going to use a JSON file. And let's create the index. So now we can drag and drop the file here. And we will see a preview. This is going to help us in creating the schema. So if we create the schema, we should say title is of type string. Description is of type string, again. But rating is of type number. Genres. I have no idea how to pronounce this word, so I'm very sorry. Uh, it's of type enum, and it's going to be an array. You can also auto detect the schema if you wish, but for the purposes of the demo, I'm showing how to properly write it. What's important to know is that you only should put data here that you mean uh, to search through. So if you don't want to search through title, for example, just remove it. Only put the data you want to search through or filter through. So we want to search through the entire data here. We will enable the automatic embedding generation. So we can select either OpenAI or Orama. For the purpose of this demo, I know a lot of people is using OpenAI already, so I'll be just using OpenAI. We can select which properties to consider for um, embedding generations. Right now, we only consider string properties by default. So title, description, yeah, we'll select both. Save and deploy. So this is going to take somewhere between one minute and three minutes. And the reason why it's going to be so slow at the beginning is because we have to calculate all the vectors. And we're going to insert all the vectors in our vector storage. Um, and so we have to rely on OpenAI. So for every single document, we have to call OpenAI, get the response, put it in the storage, et cetera. From the second time you're going to deploy them, uh, of course, there will be a cache. So it's going to be a lot faster. And you should expect such a small data set to be online in 30 seconds in 300 global locations worldwide. You can always see the status by looking at the logs. And as soon as this finishes, uh, you will see the endpoint and the API key that you need to make requests. So we'll do one thing. I'll go on Visual Studio Code. I already created a um, bit project. So we're trying to do that in like 10 minutes. We'll see if we can do that. Um, let's install a couple of dependencies. So first of all, BAN, because I really like BAN, I want to be honest. <laughs> so we will be using BAN. And I will install Orama, mm -hmm. slash Orama, and then Orama Cloud. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So we will install Orama and Orama Cloud Client. Let's see what are them about. So Orama, of course, is going to be the Orama package itself. But then we also have Orama Cloud Client. So this is going to be 
the client that we are going to use for searching on Rama Cloud. The API are the same that we are using for Rama open source, but this time we are searching on the cloud. In the meantime, we can see that this is proceeding in inserting everything, and that should be done now. So let's go back for a moment in our terminal. All right, we installed the dependencies. We can now go back here. I can't really remember how to start a project. So, okay, that, that was easy. Um, ban, run, dev. All right, this is what we got. Let's go back. This is a very fresh installation. So we'll just go back here, remove everything. We don't want CSS, we want nothing. Um, my co-founder is the, is the head of design, so he's gonna kill me, I'm very sorry. <laughs> I won't be anything, I won't do anything <laughs> very good. Um, all right, this is what we got, and yes. We also have PH inserting everything. So this took a couple of minutes, as you can see here, two minutes exactly. Um, and we got the API endpoint and the API public key. So let's go back here. Let's create a new folder. I'll zoom in a little bit. I call this lib, where we're going to use all our libraries. Let's create orama.ts. And now let's import client. So we can import a couple of things. Orama Cloud or Orama Proxy. Um, I don't want to talk about Orama Proxy right now, but we will see why this is interesting a bit late, later. So import it and export it. Export const Orama. It's equal to new Orama client. Oops. So a couple of parameters, API key and endpoint. So the endpoint is going to be the API endpoint. And the API key, that's public. So you can share this on the front end, no problem. API key, here it is. We can start the heartbeat with a frequency of, say, three seconds and a half. So this is basically keeping Orama awake because it goes idle, uh, idle mode after you don't use it. So you, you just want to keep it awake. Um, we don't integrate this uh, built-in because sometimes you don't want this, but there's no time maybe now to discuss this. Let's just take for granted that we, we want it. <laughs> so let's go back here and import our Orama instance. All right. Then let's import, and again, I'm sorry, React developers. I'm gonna, I, I'm not a front end dev. So I'm gonna create something that it's not super optimal, <laughs> but let's import your state. Uh, from React and maybe use Epic. We're gonna use that later on. Let's create search result and set search results. Okay, good. Great copilot, thank you. Um, we're also importing a type which is nullable from Orama. So nullable, it's basically telling you that a value could be null. That, that's pretty neat. Um, we can also import results which is the type of the search results. And you can determine the type going back to your index. This is basically the type. So you go back here and you say type uh, search results. Result, it's gonna be, oops. It's basically gonna be this. The num type is not a JavaScript, uh, sorry, a TypeScript type we're gonna use now, just treat it as a string. Rating is gonna be a number. And description is going to be a string again. So that's really it. So now we have, um, let's call it type search results state, which is nullable. And we can pass search result. Cool. Now let's just create um, an input. And we're going to create a second state, which is search term, set search term, which is a string. And we now go here and say, all right, placeholder, search, not a movie, uh, something. All right. Uh, then value is going to be search term. And on change, we're going to, oh my God, I love compiler. Can I say that? that that's so, <laughs> <laughs> all the boring stuff, it's automated now. I love this. Um, cool. So now if we go back here, we will see, hello, cool. Uh, let's maybe remove the CSS from there. All right. Again, I'm 
maybe I can zoom a little bit. Okay. So go back here. Let's make some search. All right. That's so cool. um, use effect. Um, we are going to spawn this effect every single time the search term uh, changes its term. And this is going to be the search term. So the, like if I search, for example, for, I don't know, um, Pokemon, you know, this is going to be the search term. Uh, then we have mode. By default, this is full text, but I can also search for hybrid and vector. These two are only enabled if you either provide um, embeddings on your own or you generate embeddings with Rama, just like we saw previously. So in that case, just limit to, let's say, five, and you can paginate by using offset. We're not going to do that right now. Then, this is, a, oops, this is a promise. So we can just say set search results, and we can catch any error with console error. I know this is not great. Um, yes, I'm probably, I need to specify this because of TypeScript. And all right, let's keep it as is for a moment. Now we got search results. Say if we have search results, let's just. Um, I'm sorry, I think I, this is going to be like this. So, results basically, um, I forgot to use the result. As you can see, this is the API response from Rama. So, it's going to give you the count. So, if you search for Pokemon, for example, you have 1,000 results. I'm going to limit this by 10 results per page. But I'm also giving you the full amount of results inside your index. The hits, so the, the results themselves, how much time has elapsed, and face sets in case you wanted the face sets, and groups if you're grouping the, the request. So now we got search results, oops, dot hits dot map, like that. As a key, we can use result dot. ED, and then we can say um, result title, oops, document, sorry, dot title. So you see this is inheriting basically the search result type we just we just use. We can probably also say div and make another div for result document dot, I don't know, let's say description. Hopefully that should be enough. <laughs> All right. All right, so by default, I'm gonna, if you don't specify search string, string I'm gonna return to you all the documents. Of course, yeah. you can block this by saying, just return, right? So, so you're, you're not making any requests if there's no search term, um, which makes sense. Let's maybe use H2 for this. Um, I know semantically it's not correct, but I can go back here and say, Pokemon, this is working now. And I can search for Guitar Hero, maybe. Um, but you will see there is something that it's not going well. Like if you search for Guitar, you got Guitar Hero. This is because by default, Rama um, uses a threshold parameter. So if you go back here, for example, and say, let me give a, oops, a threshold of zero or 0 0.2, by default it's one. We're gonna set zero. That means, as you can see now it works, that means I only want results that has both of the uh, search term in it. So if I search for Guitar Hero, for example, the search result, either the title or the description has to have both. And I can have Guitar Hero and Hero here, that's fine. Uh, by default, we don't do that because you can customize this. Uh, by default, you could say also like 0 0.5, which means return all the results that has guitar and hero plus 50% of the results that only has one of those. If you have few results, that could be handy. You see why. But this is not the case. So let's just do that. Uh, so that's basically it. And I can also say, all right, but I want them where? In that case, um, rating is equal to or 
greater than three. So I can also say document title, and then result document dot rating. And now we should only have search results where the rating is greater than or equal to three. So let's try, let's refresh. Yes, that's correct. You see, we, we basically don't have, if I search for A, for example, we shouldn't have results that have more, uh, sorry, less than three. And I can also say, like you see now there, these are all three. Basically, we can go back and say, all right, let's do it four. And we go back, that's now four. And I haven't changed my search query. Um, we can do the same, of course, by saying only give me the, oh, sorry. Um, I forgot to put here um, H3 uh, result. Oh, because I, all right, this is not a string. This is an array of strings. Um, so I can also say only give me the adventure. So where genre is equal to adventure or includes adventure and visual novel. So you can go crazy with all the filters you want. And this is how we basically create an index on Rama. I believe that's fairly simple, but I developed that with my team. So I'm looking for feedback here. Like if you want to join as a <laughs> as an early adopter and, and try this out, I'd be very glad to, to hear some feedback. And that's basically how we do that. And last thing we can, we can share is mode, maybe do vector. So threshold, it's not available when you're using vector. Nice search, for example, for um, game for children. You basically get data based not on the keywords, but on the um, on the meaning of description and title in that case. So that's how easy you can create, you know, um, your own vector search database that works on the client, so on the browser at the edge, et cetera. And I truly love this product and I believe this is gonna be interesting for many people. This is super powerful. Wow, thank you so much for walking us through this. Um, are you, are there templates available or planning to make any templates available so that you know people could do this, for example, with a ready-made uh, template? Yeah. Yeah, I really wish we we get this. Now you, um, you have one template specifically, which is, on uh, Vercel Commerce. So if you go on Vercel Commerce, for example, uh, you have Orama with the demo. So this is a demo using Orama Cloud, for example, or searching through the Vercel Commerce, uh, let's say cap, for example. So you can probably use the fork <coughs> as, a, as a template for your e-commerce website if you're using uh, Vercel Commerce, for example, and Shopify in that specific case. Uh, but yes, we definitely need uh, to create more templates, and we also need help to create templates, so we could get some bounties going, uh, if you will. I, I really love this idea, so yeah, why not? Yeah, absolutely. You heard it first, guys. Uh, <laughs> <on this cover. laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Michele. We'll be talking again soon. This was excellent, and thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank Until you. Until next time. Cheers. Thank you.